I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 7, and we're going to read verse 1 through 8. And Lord, I pray that what you gave me, you'll give them. The revelation that you gave me, you'll anoint so I can communicate it, give them ears to hear, and a heart to receive this prophetic message from your throne in Jesus' amazing name. Amen? 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1 through 8. Then Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time a say of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two sayers of barrel for a, she for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he said, in fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Oh. Now there were four le leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? Mm. If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there, and if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live, and if they will kill us, we shall, die, we shall only die. And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. Oh. <laughs> for, the Lord has for the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack mm. us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. And when these lep lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent and ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. <laughs> then they came back and entered another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid it. <laughs> this is such a crazy story. Because we're living in a time right now where they're saying recession, recession, recession. They're saying terrorism. They're saying all these different problems around the world. They're saying potential diseases. Things may be looking pretty bad, but not as bad as it was looking there. Because the Jews were surrounded by a Syrian army. It was bad. So bad, they were eating their animals. They ate the, horse, they ate the horses. They cooked the donkeys. Things got so bad, they even started cooking babies. Two moms got together and said, okay, today we'll eat your baby, and tomorrow we'll eat mine. And so they started cooking their own children to eat. They were starving, because that's what used to happen in these days. In times like that, an enemy army would surround a fortified city, and basically they just starve them to death until they were too weak to fight, or basically they take their own life. In this case, they're trying to eat whatever they can. They're trying to hold on. They're trying to hold on. Now, before we see this story happening, we're told in verse 31 and 32 of chapter 6 that the king has said, go and find Elisha. He's basically bringing all this garbage on him, and I want you to kill him. And so here there's a death threat against Elisha. I spoke with Rambo two days ago or three days ago, and he told me there's been death threats against all pastors in India. And yet, just the other day, I think it was New Year's Eve, he had 18,000 in a meeting. Things are crazy, things are happening in India right now, where there may be death threats, but when there are threats against you or me or the body of Christ, that's when God really begins to move. And I want to challenge you, we may be living in tough times, but not as tough as this. There, in Elisha's time, the economy was completely shot. Safety was completely shot. Relationships were completely divided because there was no money, there was no food. They started eating their own babies. Now, Elisha does not retaliate. Notice what he does. He doesn't say, oh, you want to threaten my life? I curse you even worse. He begins to prophesy good on them. Look what happens here. It says, tomorrow, about this time, things are going to change. Everybody say, who remembers that sermon by Joseph Garlington? Everybody say, tomorrow, about things are going to, everybody say it again, tomorrow, about this, things are going to change. And I'm telling you right now, prophetically God gave me this message, things are going to start changing in your life. You say, well, nothing changes in a day. Well, then you've not been around for the gas prices. 
I remember a few days ago when, when $4 was the cost of a, 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 gas, a, a gallon of gas, but now it's under $2. It happened this quick. I remember just a few months ago, a month or two ago, when home prices were, were skyrocketing and all of a sudden, bam, ne- you can get a house almost at half price now. I remember when there was five major financial institutions and then there's only basically two left. I, I can remember some things that just happened and it's happened so quickly. I was reading an article yesterday or the day before and it said, we don't know what's happening, but it seemed like everybody decided to refinance the same day. Finance companies right now and funding companies, mortgage companies, are now being inundated with refinancing requests. And they said it seems like everybody decided to do it in one day. Friends, I want to tell you something. Everything can change in one day. Everything can change in one day. Did I know my sister-in-law at 60 years old would pass away this past year in 2000? We didn't know that. No one anticipated the fact that she was going to die, but it happened just like that in one day. We don't know these things are going to happen, but Elisha begins to prophesy not more doom. He prophesies a turning of events that would shake everybody's life. But verse 2, the officer said, he said this, and the officer was a general. He was actually the highest general in the uh, Sumerian army. He was the three-star general. That's what it means. He says, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? So in other words, he responds with unbelief. How are you going to respond to my prophetic word today? Are you going to be in unbelief? Oh, no, things can't change my life in one day. It's been like that for 40 years. It's been like that for 20 years. Will you respond to the prophetic word today with unbelief, or will you say, I seize this word. It's for my life. I'll never forget just a few months ago, I was telling about a man in our church who instead of being in recession, he was prospering so much, he was going to start a brand new company. I announced it to all the people at our church, I think I announced it three times as a testimony, it was over the internet. So in other words, there's 5,000 or so that attend our church, and the internet, there's thousands that, that connect at any given time during the week. So potentially, five, six, seven, eight thousand people were watching that day. And guess how many people came up to me and said, who is that businessman that's starting a new company? Because this man didn't have a job. There's only one man in all the thousands and thousands and thousands that I spoke to that day that actually came up to me and said, Pastor, who is that man that's starting a new business? Can I get his phone number and his name? I said, absolutely. So I gave him the phone number and name. Guess who got a job with that company? That one man that responded out of the thousands that could have responded, only one man responded and he got the job. All right. So the officer chose not to believe, and, and Elisha says, fine, then you're not going to, you're going to see it, but you won't receive it. In other words, the only thing that can stop the blessings of God in your life besides sin is unbelief. You literally can stop your salvation by and stop the blessings of heaven by unbelief. When the man of God says it, when the Word of God says it, when the Spirit of God says it, you go, oh, it's not for me, it's for someone else. Now check this out. That officer, that general, didn't receive the word. But four people did receive the word. They're called the lepers. Could you read that uh, verse 4 again, please? If we say, we will enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. (laughs) And if we sit here, we die also. (laughs) Now therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall only die. This is such a great story because I I call this what if thinking. Everybody say what if thinking. What if I did this? What if we did that? What if we did this? They begin to look for solutions or a different way of seeing their problem. In other words, you're saying if we stay here, we're going to die. If we, go, if we go back into our own city, we're going to die. And they probably couldn't have been let in because they were lepers. The word leper is literally the Hebrew word for scourging. Because when the Hebrews try to describe leprosy, it's like someone being scourged. You know what scourging means? You take a whip of, with a cat of nine tails, you whip, and then you rip. You whip, and then you rip. And each time you rip, the pieces of glass or pieces of pottery or pieces of rock that were there grab the skin and rip it. So when the Hebrews try to describe someone that had leprosy, it was like they had been scourged. In other words, lepers, and we've sent teams, when we're in India, we sent teams into leper colonies. They still, they, they, their, their ears are falling off, their nose are falling off, their fingers are falling off, their extremities begin to fall off, and their skin is falling off. 
So the only ones that hear this message in their spirit, we don't even know if they heard it auditory, but they heard it in their spirit because they say, what a thinking. Let's, why are we going to die here? We go inside, we're going to die? In fact, there's one uh, commentary that believes that these four guys, Brian, were Gehazi and his three children. Some of you remember in 2 Kings chapter 5, when Elisha, Gehazi basically had been lying to the prophet, and, and Elisha prophesied leprosy on him. There's a common belief that the men and the three boys was Gehazi and his three kids, because it was on him and his kids. Leprosy. And so perhaps this was Gehazi's second chance. Perhaps this was Gehazi's chance to redeem himself from his previous sin. And I tend to believe it's true because in 2 Kings chapter 8, we see Gehazi becoming a counselor to the king again. I believe it's very, very possible these four lepers have now been identified as Gehazi, the past servant of Elisha, and his three sons. Now, check this out. These four lepers begin to experience what I call life-changing paradigm shifts. They begin to change the way they think by asking the question, what if, what if, what if? They reason together. The Bible says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Not only did they reason together, they spoke of a new strategy. Not only that, but they decided to take action. And the action was, hey, literally the term there in the Hebrew means, let's go throw ourselves at the feet of our enemy. Now, I got an interesting way of looking at this, Brian. You know what it means? It means they said, God, give me favor even with my enemy. I believe that you and I can begin to ask for favor in 2009, even from our enemies. Right now, we have a little contention with our, our, our uh, prayer tower and prayer mountain. We've got some opposition now. And it's a great time to say, God, give me favor even with my enemies. Give me favor with even people that oppose us, Lord. Give me favor. And that's what these guys do. The lepers say, I want to sit, think outside the box. Let's go present ourselves to our enemies and see if we're going to live through this experience. Now, here's the crazy thing. Look what it says here. Uh, it says at verse 5, read it please, my great son. And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, <laughs> to their surprise, no one was there. <laughs> I like that. To their surprise. Isn't that great, Dan? Think about that. Chris, isn't that great? They get there, and there's nobody there, except for the tents are still there, the gold's still there, the silver's still there, the horses that they'd been eating, remember that? They'd already eaten their horses and their donkeys. Now they have horses and donkeys and gold and silver, and clothes and weapons are all still there because they had fled. Now read verse 7, please. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight, and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. <laughs> Check this out. Underline the word twilight in verse 5 and the word six, verse 6, because notice that what they did is they started to move towards the enemy's camp at twilight. You say, why at twilight? Because the Jews, their day started not in the morning, their day would start at dusk. A Jew... When he came to 5 or 6 o'clock, it was the end of his day, and at 6 o'clock, his new day began. So in other words, they prophetically announced, I am now walking in a new day. Come on, let's walk to the enemy's camps at night. Now, friends, if you're going to surrender to somebody, you don't want to surrender at night. You want to know why? Because they see someone, if a watchman sees someone coming, you know, hey, what do you want? <laughs> Hey, what do you want? <laughs> they're waving a white flag. Hey, they're waving a gun. You know, or a, you get killed. But they're coming at night because that's the beginning of their new day. And everybody say, it's the beginning of the new day for me. I prophesied that, that 2009 would be my harvest and our harvest time, the greatest harvest of our lives. Why? Not because the circumstances demonstrated, it's because God spoke it. When Elisha spoke, it was the worst time of anybody's life. They'd never had times like this. But he said, oh, things are going to change tomorrow. And I'm prophesying to you right now. Things are going to begin to change for those that receive this prophetic word and begin to function in that word. Is anybody here right now? Everybody declare, it's a new day for me. Come on, everybody say, it's a new day for my family. Come on, just begin to seize that word. Seize that word today. It's prophetic. This is not a sermon. It's a prophecy for you because God gave this to me. 
And I noticed something the other day when I was sharing with staff. It says in verse 7 that the enemy started to flee at twilight. <laughs> and the Bible says that God made them hear chariots and horses and a great army. So in other words, here's this. Four lepers start walking to the enemy camp at night. At the very same time, God takes the noise of their footsteps and converts it into the sound of chariots, horses, an army. <laughs> oh, go, 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 Paul, go, go, go. <laughs> That's what happens to a little boy with a sack lunch. He goes, I got a lunch. It's 5,000 people to feed. Come on, I got a lunch. And God says, oh, just give me something to work with, baby. Give me something to work with. I'll take that sack lunch, and I'll convert it into a feast for 5,000. At the end, there'll be 12 baskets and this and that. Friends, give in 2009. Give God something to work with. Give him a sack lunch. Give him anything. Four lepers walking to the enemy and says, "That's I was waiting for someone to move. I was waiting for, I was waiting for someone to do something. I was waiting. I, I felt like Jim Carrey there. Somebody stop me. <laughs> the mask. Ah, somebody. He's just waiting for somebody to give him something. God wants something to work with from your life." You say, well, I have nothing to give. Then that's because Satan has deceived you into a poverty mentality. I want to give you some stuff that you can give in 2009 because if it's harvest time, it's sowing time. If I want harvest in 09, I better start sowing now. Check this out. This is what God gave me. And I want you to write these down. How to give when you feel like you have very little? Well, you can start by giving love. <laughs> It won't cost you anything. It might cost you a little time or humility, or it might cost you to get out of your box, but give a little bit of love. How about forgiveness? How about forgiving some people that have offended you in the past? And just verbally say, oh, Lord, I forgive Bill, I forgive my dad, I forgive Jim, whatever. How about giving some hope to someone who's lost hope? How about giving a word of encouragement to someone around you? Or how about humbling yourself and giving humility by saying, hey, I know in the past I've really hurt you, but I really want to begin to love you the way I should. How about comfort the hurting? The Bible says the Holy Spirit's a comforter, but he wants to use you or companionship to the lonely. My mom, I told you this, 88 years old, now goes down to the second floor of her residence to visit the Alzheimer patients. And my mom at 88 years old is now ministering to Alzheimer's patients. Even though she's had two strokes, she's going down and pouring out, giving to hurting and the lonely. How about giving courage to the fearful? It won't cost you anything. How about giving stuff away? Friends, we know we have too much stuff, and we get this attitude, we have nothing. No, gifts, you have some old DVDs sitting in the shelf gathering dust, give them away. As long as they're clean, give them to somebody else. If they're not clean, burn them. How about the, book, the last book that you really enjoyed reading? Give it away to someone. Say, hey, after you read it, give it to someone else. Hey, I, it blessed me, I want it to bless you. How about burning a CD? There's one time I was driving Samuel's car, and, and I'll, I'll never forget turning on the, the CD player, and there was a, a, a CD that he burned for his girlfriend. And it was all these love songs. He's very romantic. And I, I tell you what, I just felt like kissing Denise right after hearing those songs. And, baby, I love you. Baby, come back. <laughs> Have I told you lately that I love you? Yeah, baby, that's right. Don't go changing. I know, there's all these, though, but he was playing like Michael Bublé and all these other people, and really romantic stuff. That was smooth, Sammy, smooth. You're a chip off the old block, baby. <laughs> How about sending a letter and a card thanking someone for being your coach, your mentor, your teacher? What if you went to your teachers, young people, and said, listen, I want to thank you for teaching. You, you want to, you know, I know sometimes you felt like killing your teacher. You want to really kill them? Just tell them how much you appreciate them. <laughs> tell them you thank them for, for doing what they do because they don't get a whole lot of thanks. And I want to tell you something. You want to, be, you want to get favor in your classroom? You begin to show appreciation. A letter, a card. How about strength to the weak or faith to the lost? How about bringing people to church? We're adding chairs now. It's, we, we're adding chairs. Why? Because you must be bringing people because it's one of the greatest things. The Bible says, he who wins souls is wise. You bring someone to church, you're a wise person, and you're giving something that doesn't cost you anything but maybe a little time and energy. I could go on and on about things you can give away. 
I know when Sergio and Kathy started coming to this church, Sergio started bringing his sons to go and feed the homeless. Kathy started coming to early morning prayer every single morning. They would all, he'd come and they'd come and she'd come and they started giving immediately, immediately. And I thought, man, maybe they want to join our staff one day. Because I thought that's the type of person that needs to be on our team, people that are givers. They may not have a lot of finances, but you know what? They give. You may not have a lot of finances, but there's so many more things you can do. And make this year become crazy generous people this year. Someone say with me, I'm going to become a crazy generous person this year. Oh man, you're not saying with any life at all. Say, I'm going to become a crazy generous person this year. Daryl sparked us last week when he gave his entire tithe for the entire year. Now he says, everything I give from now on is offering. I like that. I mean, he sparked me and Denise, but he sparked a lot of other people. Betty just sparked us this morning. But it's not all about money. It's about all these other things. You can be a generous person every single day of your life, and you'll become a person that harvests because the Bible says that he's no man's debtor. If you're, if you're a giver of anything, he'll going to give back to you, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing like a root beer float. Come on now. Anybody still here with me? So notice that they started marching at twilight, and God takes that sound at twilight, turns it into the sound of chariots. You give a sack lunch to God, he turns it into a feast. You start, four lepers start marching towards the enemy. What does God do? He sends the enemy away. Why? Most of us run away from our fears instead of running towards them. Most of us run away from risk instead of running towards it. Most, oh, I, I love this. I got this email, this devotional. I got to read this to you. Oh, this is so good. Writing's really small. Oops. This new year, stop doing what everybody else is doing. Stop doing what you've always done. Most human beings deeply desire to be used by God in unique and extraordinary ways. Most human beings talk about these desires. And every New Year's, most make resolutions about how they'll change their lives in order to see these desires fulfilled. But few do. Trust God with a unique and extraordinary faith this year. Do things that few do. As Numbers 13 records, 12 spies took inventory of the Promised Land. All of them desired to go in, but only two were willing to fight for it. Only two. He goes, see what I'm saying? Many desire, but few do. In 2009, I want you to be one of the few who do. Bam. Bam. Take it. Take it. Does that make sense to you? Few do, but you can. You can begin to do things you've never been done before. I want to leave you these five thoughts. Men and women of God, I want you this year to speak prophetically. Begin to proclaim that this is your harvest year. Proclaim that you are going to be different. Proclaim that you are going to see changes. And begin to proclaim that this is a new day. Everybody say, this is a new day for my life. This is a new day for my church. Pray the prayer of Jabez again. Make daily confessions. Number two, some will not receive the word. Friends, and I'm telling you right now, I don't want you to be that person because it'll close the door on your salvation. It'll close the door on your blessing. Don't be the one that says, no, I don't believe it can change in a day. The Bible says you begin to say, I received that word, and I'm going to activate it through faith every day. Don't close the door on your blessing. Don't close the door through unbelief. Thirdly, some will take action and leave the results to God. Notice he converts a sack lunch into a banquet. He takes four marching lepers and turns it into an army. Four, God can use the least thing to spark a revival and breakthrough in finances and spirit in the family. Could this have been Gehazi's second chance? Can I tell you something? When I first got saved, you look at me now and you go, oh, wow, so cool. Look what he's doing. But can I tell you, friends, it is a blessing. But you need to understand who I am. I'll never forget when I first received the gospel, he started sending me from drugs and alcohol and lying and all these other things. And I'll never forget, I, I was so afraid. I wanted everybody to like me, and I didn't understand the Bible very well, and, but I knew that Jesus was in my life, and I wanted others to experience Jesus. And so I remember saying, oh, God, I need courage to begin to share my faith with others. And I was on a long bus trip. We'd go on four, five, six-hour bus trips to go to a hockey game in some far-out region. And on this bus trip, because I wouldn't party anymore and I wouldn't drink and take drugs anymore. I was kind of alone. 
So I said, Lord, give me the faith to, give me the faith to share my faith in Jesus. I sat next to a guy named Paul Legault. He may be watching today. Who knows? He is a white guy with an afro. You had to see this. He had this massive afro. And so I figured I'll witness to him because he seemed like a good guy, maybe open. So God gave me the courage. Man, I wasn't very much. I was like a little leper. I'd just gotten over drugs and just returned to stolen articles that I'd stolen from the street. And I was doing all this, you know, trying to change. And all of a sudden, bam, I'm witnessing to this guy about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. A little something. I gave, I gave God something to work with. But can I tell you what happened? He told his mother, his mother was a, a, a school teacher in a Catholic school system. And so through Paul, Paul said, my mom wants you to come and share your story to her kids in her classroom, 30 or 40 kids. So I got the privilege of going in there. I was so terrified. I'd never preached. I'd never really done anything. I just barely managed to witness for the first time, really. And I think it was my first time witnessing. And so I go to this classroom, scared out of my wits. Not only that, it was a French classroom. And I just started learning Christian songs, and I didn't really know any French Christian songs. And so here I was going in this classroom, cold turkey. No one ever taught me how to preach a sermon or teach a Sunday school class. Nobody ever taught me how to sing a Christian song. But I knew one English song. I think I knew one, An Amazing Grace, and I think this one. And the song is something wonderful, something good. All my confusion he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful of my life. That's like the only other song I knew besides Amazing Grace. So here I am teaching in French about my new faith in Jesus to 30 kids in a classroom, 40 kids in a classroom. And all of a sudden, out of the spontaneity of the Holy Spirit, I translated into French. C'est si merveilleux, c'est si bon, il a compris toute ma confusion. Tout ce qu'il voulait de moi, c'était de marcher par la foi, car il a fait de moi dans un jour son enfant. And then I had the kids, come on. I didn't have much to give God, but I gave him what I had, and I said, kids, bow your heads. I had them bow their heads. I believe that almost every single kid accepted Jesus Christ in that classroom. I had them lift up their hands. I said the sinner's prayer with them. They received Jesus. Someone say amen. Amen. Well, then what happened is, then what happened was the mother loved what I had so much, she went to the leadership of the school and said, could you have Paul share in every single classroom? And I started going from classroom to classroom sharing the story about how Jesus came into my life and how Jesus would come into their life. And classroom after classroom, I'd see people receiving Jesus. I started with something simple, a leper like me. Drugs, alcohol, depression, suicidal thoughts, all the other things that I was. And I said, Lord, but I'll give you my little sack lunch. And if you could, if you can use this, this would be a wonderful thing. And that's how I got here today. I took my little sack lunch full of hurt and pain and discouragement, and I said, Lord, I'm going to give you something to work with. I don't know what you have. You may be the sharpest person in Las Vegas. I heard a story the other day. I I got to meet this man. He's a genius. He's an inventor. And uh, he was so tormented by life and the enemy and, and pressures of life that basically he looked like a homeless person. He showed up after Pastor Jean Tulpain's church. And we helped Jean buy his building. And so our church helped him buy the building. And so this man enters the building like a homeless person, goes to Pastor Jean. Jean, Jean leads him to Christ, prays for him. This man ends up being one of the smartest young men in all of North America. He's a massive inventor. And now God showed him how to uh, invent these light bulbs and a light bulb kit to bring light to every single African village in Africa. It started with a guy looking looking like a homeless guy and a pastor saying, it actually, rewind the tape, it started with us helping Ja buy his building. And now that building is there to bring people in that are hurting. This guy gets one to the Lord. He now is a genius for Jesus. And now he's inventing stuff to change and bring light to places where there's no electricity. He does it all in, I mean, the guy's a super, super genius. I want to just challenge you something. I wasn't a genius. I was a mess. But I took my sack lunch. You may be a genius, but if you give it to God, he'll make you better. You may be someone like me, a leper, who gives my sack lunch to Jesus, and he converts that sound into the sound of a mighty army.